Well, hello, everybody. This is Professor Sam Lanzafami again, and we're going to continue our video series on principles of accounting. Today's topic is merchandise accounting. And one of the things that we want to be aware of is that we have some new terminology when we're dealing with merchandise accounting. I don't want you to think that whatever you covered in the first four chapters of your accounting book were wasted. Just the opposite. We're actually building upon that information that we've already utilized. So if you can see the screen right now, uh, you will notice that in yellow at the top, I have some new account titles that we want to get familiar with. First one you see there is merchandise inventory. Some people just refer to it as inventory alone. What you need to realize is that, a, that that account is a current asset, which means it goes up by a debit and decreases by a credit. Another new account is cost of goods sold, often abbreviated or uh, labeled as COGS, C-O-G-S. Another new account, sales. And that's a big change from what we saw in the first four chapters of accounting principles because we were dealing with a service company before. So we would have accounts like service revenue, consulting revenue. So whenever you performed some sort of service, that's what we dealt with in the first four chapters. Now we make a shift. Now we're doing books for companies that sell stuff for a living, like you know your local store, your local department store, national department store. So we're now selling goods as opposed to performing services. But now that you're selling stuff, you know that your customers can now return stuff back to you if they're dissatisfied. So we have sales, returns, and allowances, and we also have an account called sales discounts. So think of us being a store selling to another store, or think of us being a factory selling to a store, and we're dealing with you know other businesses. And sometimes when you deal with other businesses, you might give them a break for paying you sooner than later. So that's where a sales discount comes into play. In addition, we also have, uh, at the top right of the screen, two different types of inventories that can actually be utilized in merchandise accounting. One is called perpetual inventory, and I have a quick little definition there. Inventory is constantly updated through the inventory account. So that account that you see below, merchandise inventory, under perpetual inventory, it's extremely busy. It is constantly involved in transactions. Okay, so it's kind of like a Mr. Popular account in this chapter when you're working under perpetual. Another way to describe perpetual inventory is think of uh, every time you go to the grocery store and you buy something, your product is scanned by the cashier, scanned out. And every time that product gets scanned out, it not only you know, the cash register not only generates a receipt for you, but it also updates the company or the store's inventory system. And in reality, before you ever saw that product, before you ever got to the store, that product came off of a truck. And when it came off the truck, the store scanned that product into the system. So under perpetual inventory, we always have some sort of a clue as to what's in our inventory. Of course, you know, some people might steal. You might hear, like at a grocery store, uh, an item falling off the shelf and breaking, clean up in aisle three, you know, and sometimes they don't record that product being broken. It just gets thrown away. So no matter, even if we're recording things perpetually and we are able to have a really good idea what's in our inventory, you still got to count your inventory periodically. You know, whether it's once a month, once a week, once a year, but you're supposed to count your inventory on a regular basis. This way, you can kind of compare with what you thought to what you actually have. And if there's a shortage, you have to do an adjusting entry. And just FYI, that adjusting entry would be to debit cost of goods sold and credit merchandise inventory if you did have a shortage. Debit cost of goods sold, credit merchandise inventory. That's the adjusting entry if you had a shortage when you counted and compared it to what you thought. OK, 
Okay, so you notice I mentioned cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is an actual GL, G as in general, L as in ledger. It's an actual GL account, which means it's involved in debiting and crediting. It's an actual account. I, I make that point because under the periodic inventory system, which is the alternate system that you see at the top right, cost of goods sold is not a GL account. Cost of goods sold is something that you calculate on an income statement, like gross profit, net income, total expenses. Those are things you calculate on a statement. You don't debit or credit something called gross profit. You don't debit or credit net income. You don't debit or credit total expenses. That's just something you end up figuring out on the statement. So under perpetual, cost of goods sold is an actual GL account, but under periodic, it is not. Under periodic, the inventory is only updated when you count the inventory. So merchandise inventory was Mr. Popular under perpetual, but under periodic, it's like a ghost town account. It's only used when you count the inventory. So if you count the inventory every day, okay, then it's going to be pretty, pretty used. It's going to be used pretty often. But if you count it once a year, you're only going to use that account once a year. So uh, sometimes it becomes a challenge as to you know which inventory system should be used. And I have a quick little answer for that is is this: if the product that you are engaged in if it is scannable, in other words, has a barcode, a UPC symbol, I would bet 99 out of 100%, it's probably the system being used is perpetual because it's easy to track. Just scan it and things get updated instantly. So if you have a product that may not be scannable, let's say maybe food type items, then you would most likely be using the period periodic inventory system. So a lot of restaurants will end up using periodic because if you think about it, they pretty much count minimum once a week and a lot of them will count daily. So it fits real nice for them to use the periodic system. But I would say take restaurants, fast food restaurants out of the mix and I would bet the majority of companies out there that maintain inventory probably use perpetual. So because of that, we're going to focus on perpetual in this example. Okay. Before I continue, let's again just review the new accounts that you see in yellow. Merchandise inventory, it's a new asset, more specifically a current asset. Remember, a current asset is an asset you expect to either get rid of or turn into cash within one year or less time. We have a new expense. It's called cost of goods sold. It's the first expense we've run into since we've been doing these videos that does not end with the word expense. So again, a little freaky of an account that doesn't fit the mold. Then you have a new revenue account called sales. That's going to replace the old service revenue that we saw in the first four chapters. With sales, it has two contras associated with it, sales returns and sales discounts. So sales is part of the liquor side. Remember in those first four chapters and all 10 videos that I've previously done, we talked about you know, debit aid and liquor, debit aid, assets, drawing expenses. If you're with a corporation, it's assets, dividends, and expenses. But the debit aid accounts go up by a debit. Your liquor accounts, liabilities, capital, and revenue, those three categories go up by a credit. If you happen to be doing the books for a corporation, instead of capital, you would then have retained earnings and common stock but we can still refer to them as the liquor accounts. L for liabilities, C for capital, C uh, and L, excuse me, and R for revenue. Don't know my alphabet all of a sudden. But so we've got our debit aid accounts, we've got our liquor accounts. So where sales, sales is revenue. So revenue would be part of liquor, but sales returns and sales discounts, they're contra. So even though they're part of the sales family, they work the opposite. So they actually, the contra revenues actually work like debit aid, even though they're still part of the sales, part of the revenue category. We have seen a contra before, and that was when we were in chapter three of accounting principles, and we were exposed to accumulated depreciation. 
That account, if you recall, was a contra to a long-term asset like equipment or a building. So uh, even though the building or the equipment would be an asset and it would be part of debit aid, accumulated depreciation worked contra, opposite of that. So it actually worked like a liquor account, but it was still classified as part of the asset family. So you've seen contras before. A couple other little things that we want to be aware of. If you look in blue to the right of the screen, uh, we now, every time we write accounts receivable or we write accounts payable, we want to attach a caboose to that, meaning that we may have tons and tons of customers. So we're going to attach a customer name to accounts receivable. And the same thing with all our debts and accounts payable. We always want to attach from now on, you know, some identification. So for fun, I came up with some funny names. So let's say we have four customers. We got John Doe. We got his wife, a lot of dough. We got their kid who never gets in trouble, cookie dough. And then we have the kid who's always in trouble, kid is on drugs, fried dough. <laughs> so we've got the dough family. And basically, by keeping track of each individual, we're able to bill each of them individually. So our accounts receivable that you see in blue, let's pretend that was $1,000. Let me just put 1000 in here. So let's say of that 1000 let's say John owes us 100 a lot of owns owes us 100 as well, Cookie owes us 200 and to take care of that bad habit, <laughs> fried dough owes us 600 all right, but you notice that the subsidiary ledger 6 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 equals what's in the general ledger or the main T account of $1,000. All right, so I just wanted to, to give you an idea that we have what we call subsidiary ledgers, which is a detailed version of your general ledger. So if I were to hide those, the Doe family, and I just showed you accounts receivable with 1000 in it, and I said, so who owes me that thousand? You'd have no idea until you saw the breakdown and the breakdown is found in the subsidiary ledger. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out to you guys. So let me get rid of these numbers. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue doing some actual examples out of which is most likely chapter five in most accounting principles books. We want to look at things from a managerial point of view Starting with this chapter, we want to start making some decisions and understanding how, you know, journal, how deciding between perpetual and periodic, that's that's a major decision that has to be made by the company execs. Um, so let's run through some quick examples here. We're going to look at some transactions, not only from a uh, buyer's point of view, but also a seller's point of view. So let's look at it from a buyer's point of view first. So I'm going to create some transactions and we're going to analyze them. Before I create them though, let me just bring your attention to the bottom right of the screen. You will notice I have a few more little definitional type things. Uh, first thing you see at the bottom right are the terms. We will now see the word terms when we look at transactions. In the past, we used to hear words like, hey, you bought something on account or you sold or performed a service on account. We rarely will see the words on account. We now will see the word terms. And terms automatically means it's on account. So an example that I picked was 210 net 30. What does 210 net 30 mean? It means that 30 days, you got 30 days to pay. But if it's paid within 10 days, a 2% discount is given. So net 30 basically means you got 30 days to pay it. Or if this is our customer, they have 30 days to pay us. But if they pay us within 10 days, we'll knock 2% off of their final price. Another term that you will see in this section is FOB. I'm not swearing at you, I promise. It's FOB, free on board. Okay, And there are two types of FOBs. <laughs> Sounds like I'm saying something funny there. Two types of FOBs in this world. There's the mean ones, and then there's the not mean ones. No. So FOB shipping point. FOB shipping point means the buyer is responsible for paying the shipping. However, if you see FOB destination, the seller is responsible for paying the shipping. 
if you've taken a business law course, you've probably been exposed to FOB shipping point and FOB destination as well, because basically, uh, in a, from a business law point of view, if anything happens to the shipment, we have to figure out who's responsible for it, whose insurance company is going to take care of it. So there's some connection to some other courses as well. Okay, so you'll see those terms as we go forward. Over here under the yellow box, I'm going to just create some fictitious examples, and then I'll show you the journal entry to the left. So let's say uh, it is September 9th, and let's say the transaction goes something like this. Again, we're going to look at it from the buyer's point of view first, because we've got to buy stuff before we can sell it to our own customers. So let's say we purchased... Uh, merchandise uh, from the ABC company. Actually, let's, uh, yeah, from the ABC company for $5,000. Terms 210, net 30. FOB shipping point. So we bought stuff from ABC company for $5,000, terms 210 net 30, FOB shipping point. So when reading this, we have to figure out what do we debit, what do we credit? Well, because this is perpetual, we're going to debit the merchandise inventory account. We are acquiring inventory. And remember, when in doubt, every transaction I show you today, I bet you seven out of eight of them will involve merchandise inventory. So if I ask you what accounts involved, there's a take a guess that it's probably merchandise inventory, one of your moves. So, and that is the case here. So let's put in, we'll pretend we're doing this in 2017, and this is September 9th. And what we want to do is we want to debit merchandise inventory. Again, uh, some people just call it inventory. So debit merchandise inventory, and we are going to credit accounts payable. And again, we need to attach the caboose. We want to attach who, because what if I buy from five different organizations? I got to be able to keep my book straight. So we bought from ABC Company. <clears throat> and this transaction costs us $5,000. Most people will probably put some of this explanation material uh, in the explanation of the journal entry, but for us, we'll just keep it optional. So let me show you how it would look. You would basically put in the 210 net 30, because you could have different terms for different companies. So don't think that it's always automatically the same. Could be. Some places don't even give discounts. They might just say net 30. And you have 30 days to pay. And we want the FOB shipping point. Abbreviate to your heart's content in the explanation. Okay? So I would take this information and post it. Uh, let's, um, let's see here. Well, I'll just leave the posting out for right now. I just want you to know that we can post it. But I'll, I'll come back to that later. All right, so that's our first transaction. Let's put this in a certain color so that we can color code our transaction so it's easier to follow along. Okay, the next transaction is somebody's got to pay the shipping. Is it us or is it the seller? So how about if I say September 9th again over here, make you think a little bit, the appropriate party paid the $100 shipping charge. So that's the next transaction. So we have to determine, is this us or do we just ignore this step? And again, what's going to break our tie that might be in your head or help you figure it out is basically FOB shipping point. When you see FOB shipping point, 
it basically tells you the buyer is responsible for the shipping. We are the buyer in this case. So that means we have to do the entry. So on the 9th, any idea what we might debit, what we might credit? Remember what I said earlier, if you're in doubt, guess what account's involved? And if you're thinking merchandise inventory, you're right. If you were thinking, oh, I thought it was going to be like debit freight or debit shipping. If we were doing periodic, you would have been right. But under perpetual, it's merchandise inventory. So the merchandise inventory account is involved. And because I said paid, we're going to credit cash. And there's our second entry. So you may have been surprised by that transaction. You may not have been, but I remember the first time I saw it, I was surprised. Because it's confusing, because it's like, what, if I'm getting more stuff when I pay shipping? No. What this is saying is that uh, the stuff that we bought for $5,000 really has cost us $5,100. So it's adding to the cost of the item that we acquired so that when we go to sell it, we want to take that shipping into account so that we don't lose money when we sell it to our customers. Okay. All right. Let's say it's now the 12th. September 12th, and let's pretend we were dissatisfied with what we acquired, and we want to make a return. So just like customers can return stuff to us, we can return stuff to our vendors. So let's say we returned, uh, let's go with $1,000 worth of merchandise to the ABC company. Maybe it was the wrong color, maybe it was the wrong size, uh, maybe we just changed our mind, maybe they were broken, who knows? It's irrelevant. We don't want them, we're returning them. So whenever you return something, you are basically doing the opposite of when you acquired it. So look at the first entry we did, and now we're basically going to flip it. Okay, so let me make my little green lines here. Okay, I don't know what happened to my lines here, though. It's kind of goofy. I guess my new keyboard's somewhat sensitive. So, date is the 12th, and we are returning $1,000 worth of merchandise. I will now debit accounts payable, ABC Company. For a thousand bucks, and I am going to credit merchandise inventory because I don't have it anymore. I returned it. And explanation again, explanations are optional. Might help if I can spell. Something like that, returned merchandise, okay? So let me get rid of this T account and call it accounts payable. And let me make this one the ABC company for accounts payable. AP-ABC company. So we're gonna treat this T account as our subsidiary. I'll even label that up here. Subsidiary for AP. So these two are basically joined at the hip. So let's put them in green. Okay. So if I go back and I update the first journal entry we did, we debited merchandise inventory for $5,000. So let's put that 5,000 in here. And then we credited accounts payable for $5,000 as well. 
We want to make sure that our subsidiary always links up with our GL accounts. So there's going to be 5,000 in that account. So this is always, this is like John Doe, Jane, or a lot of dough. Jane Doe. Hey, look at that. Another good one. Cookie dough, fried dough, you know, bread dough, whatever. So this is very similar to what we we're discussing here, except this was for accounts receivable. This is now for accounts payable. So we'll try to link them together by color here. Okay. <clears throat> in addition, let's put that transaction in orange and this one in orange so you can see where they originated from. So we have our debit of 5,000. We have our credit of 5,000. So our debits equal our credits. If you're saying, aren't you double crediting? No, this is just kind of like a, think of this as like a uh, scrap paper for the regular account. These are the two main ones. This is the GL right here, and this is the subsidiary. The subsidiary has to always match up with what's in the GL. Okay. Then in the second transaction, we we uh, paid the shipping, so we've got to put a thousand, excuse me, a hundred dollars under merchandise inventory. So that merchandise inventory account right now indicates that we have fifty one hundred dollars worth of product. Okay, so it's important to understand that. So we're at 5,100. So now here we are on the 12th, and we return some stuff. So my accounts payable was debited for 1,000, which now creates a new balance of four grand. So because I returned $1,000 worth of stuff, whoops. I now only owe $4,000 to the ABC company. Okay, and I want to make sure that my subsidiary reflects that as well. Notice I'm copying from the GL account. So just do my little math again. So remember, your subsidiary should always link up to what's in your general. Hello, what happened there? 5,000. Oh, I hit multiplication instead of subtraction. Okay. All right, and also our merchandise inventory account has gone down as well. So if I were to run a quick balance in my merchandise inventory, it would be 5,000 plus the original 100 of shipping. And we'll subtract out the thousands. So right now we have forty-one hundred dollars worth of merchandise, of which we owe four thousand. The other hundred we paid already when we did the shipping. Okay, one more transaction from the buyer's point of view. So let's say it's now September nineteenth, and on September nineteenth, if you notice, that is ten days since the ninth. And if you remember the terms. 210 net 30. So we are paying within the 10 days. So we are going to get that discount. We're going to take advantage of the discount. So we'll put something like paid ABC company within the discount period. So that's the transaction. And now let's go ahead and do the journal entry. Let's go with a different color we haven't used yet. How about this bright blue? Okay, so now we are paying within the discount period. So this is the 19th. And the one thing we want to do is if we're paying this thing in full, we want to get rid of our debt. Okay. So we're going to debit accounts payable, ABC company, and we're going to get rid of the entire $4,000 of debt. But we don't have to actually pay $4,000 because we get to actually take a discount on that. Okay. So the discount, believe it or not, is handled through the merchandise inventory account. So we're going to take that $4,000 and we want to figure out how much of a discount we have. It's 2%. So we'll multiply that by 0.02. And 
and we have an $80 discount. So how much cash do we actually pay? 3920 or 98% of the original value. So we're going to credit cash for the difference. $39.20. Okay, so $39.20 is the amount of cash we got to come up with, and that's better than having to pay $4,000, without a doubt. So let's post this information. So ABC Company uh, is going down by $4,000, so our balance in that account is zero. So that cleans up that account. And the same thing in the subsidiary. So remember, your subsidiary always matches what's happening in the general ledger. So those are the transactions from a buyer's point of view. So now let's look at things from a seller's point of view. So now when we go to sell, we will see accounts receivable. We'll see the word sales sales returns and allowances, sales discounts, okay? So let's look at it from a sales point of view. So let's say it's now September, let's make it October. October 1st, and let's say we sold merchandise to our customer, Let's go with uh, John Doe. <clears throat> we sold merchandise to our customer, John Doe. Terms, how, let's go, how about 310 net 60? Notice how I changed the terms up for my customer. So we sold merchandise to our customer, John Doe, terms 310 net 60, FOB shipping point. And let's say we sold them $1,000. Let's go $1,100. $1,100 worth of goods. And we'll put a dollar sign in there. So we sold merchandise to our customer, John Doe, terms 310 net 60, FOB shipping point for 1100 bucks. Okay, so that's the transaction. And let's see if we can figure out what to debit and what to credit. Let's pick the color. No, that's too dark. Let's go dark green. Okay, so over here, here come the journal entries. It's October 1st, and believe it or not, you have to do two separate entries for this. This only occurs under Perpetual. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to record the accounts receivable and make sure you add the caboose, John Doe. And we're selling them $1,100 worth of stuff. <clears throat> and because we're selling this person something, or this company something, we're going to call it sales. But in order to do the next part of the transaction, I need to know some extra information. So let me give you the words first, and then I will give you the extra information. So not only did we debit accounts receivable and credit sales, we sold them stuff for $1,100. But how much of this stuff cost us? That's really important. Okay. So over here, I need to add a little extra to this. <clears throat> that cost us, let's say, $300. So we're basically selling John 
$300 worth of stuff for $1,100. In other words, John has no idea how much it cost us when we bought it from the factory. They have no idea. All they know is that it's costing them $1,100. So we have an $800 markup in this example. So here's how you handle the cost of $300. You will actually debit this new account called cost of goods sold. Remember that one I introduced in the beginning? You can either write it all out or you can take the shortcut like I am. So we're going to debit cost of goods sold for $300 which means we've got to credit something for 300 and that something, when in doubt, it's got to be merchandise inventory. So we're going to debit accounts receivable, credit sales for 1100 That's the amount of stuff we sold, but this stuff cost us 300 So we got to record not only what we sold it for, but what it costs us. So two steps, and then don't forget your explanation as well. So let's continue. I won't do any posting to T accounts this time. We're just going to just look at the journal entries. So now let's say we have another entry. We'll make it October 1st again. The appropriate party paid the shipping. So is it us or is it them? Who pays the shipping? How do you answer that? FOB shipping point. What does FOB shipping point means? The buyer is responsible. We're the seller. No entry for us. So we have, we just ignore it. We just move on. But if, you know, if we were doing John's books, John would have to include you know, some type of shipping charge, okay? And we don't know if they use periodic or perpetual. If they're using perpetual, they're probably going to debit merchandise inventory. If they're using periodic, then they're going to debit something called like freight expense or freight in, but not our problem. They, we were the seller, so we only worry about our side of things. Okay, let's go on. Let's now pretend... Hang on a second, my screen just jumped to size. There we go. Let's now uh, go with this. Uh, what if John was unhappy with what he bought? That $300 worth of stuff that he bought, he wants to return some of it. Okay? So let's say it's now October 5th, and John Doe, our customer, returns a hundred dollars worth of merchandise that cost us let's say 50 bucks so he returns some stuff for a hundred, um, and it ended up costing us fifty for the. He has no idea that it costs us fifty. This little component that he's returning to us. So John Doe returns a hundred dollars worth of merchandise that cost us fifty dollars. All right. So from a journal entry point of view, we again will do four moves, or two journal entries altogether. So think of whenever there's a purchase or a sale, the return is exactly the opposite. So on October 5th, let's return, let's do an entry to return the sale. Instead of just debiting sales outright, we'll use that one contra called sales returns and allowances. And that's going to be for 100 and we're going to credit accounts receivable. We are actually going to credit John's account because of this return. In the meantime, we got to also update our inventory. 
So John returned stuff, so our inventory is actually going back up. And we are going to undo the expense and credit cost of goods sold. And that would be for 50 bucks. So again, four steps or two journal entries split into two. Or two journal entries, it's four steps split into two different entries. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, one more entry and we will call it a day. Final entry, let's say it's now October 11th. <clears throat> and on October 11th, John Doe, our customer, pays us in full. John Doe pays us in full. Okay. So first question for you is, did John take advantage of the discount opportunity? And the answer should be yes. Because remember, we gave John 60 days to pay us, but if he pays us within 10, we'll give him a 3% discount. And he qualifies for that. So let's do this final entry. And then we'll say goodbye for today. So this is now the 11th, 10 days after the 1st. And again, we are getting money from John. So our cash is going up. I don't know how much we're going to get right off the bat, but we'll figure it out. We also know that John is going to be taking advantage of a discount. When we were the buyer, the discount was handled through merchandise inventory. Now as the seller, the discount is actually handled through an account called sales discounts. And then finally, we're going to credit John's account one final time. We've got the accounts receivable. John Doe. Okay. I can't spell today. Alrighty, so when we first started this process with John, John originally owed us $1,100, if you recall from here. And so by not doing T accounts, now we're kind of dependent on trying to patch things together instead of looking in one area. So you can see T accounts can really be helpful. But while we're here, we can because we don't have much stuff, it's not that bad. So we started out with John owing us $1,100, but if you recall, um, he returned $100 worth of stuff to us. So we'll subtract $100. So as of right now, John owed us $1,000. Okay. Now, with this transaction, he should be paying us $1,000 because that's how much he owes, but we gave John a discount opportunity and John's going to take advantage of it. So because of that 3%, we're going to figure out what 3% of $1,000 is. And I'm sure you've already figured it out in your head, 30 bucks. So we are expecting a check from John of $970. So John's going to give us 970, even though he technically owed us 1,000. He originally owed us 1,100, but if you recall, there was a return made of 100. Okay, and John owed us 1,000. He gets a 3% discount, so he's actually paying us 970. Well, that's it for transactions involving merchandise inventory. We looked at it from a buyer's point of view, and we looked at it from a seller's point of view. Hope this was helpful and next time we are together the next video will be on how do you do a an income statement under a merchandise situation all right you guys have a great day and we'll talk to you next time bye, -bye.